Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who is going to do part two of his Pacific Northwest rap tour. Last time is with Marlo in Seattle, and now we're going to Portland, Oregon with Amine and the album Limbo. Now, I call him Amine because that is his name. I spent a little bit of time in my five minutes of research before this video watching videos of him on the Genius website. And there's a whole very charming video with him where he explains how to pronounce his name and how basically white people just don't care about it. And they just call him Amin, Amin. Uh, but it's Amine. There's an accent aigu there in French. And there's a very funny part to it in which uh, he says, he's very charming in person. He says that it means I believe in Ethiopian. At least that's what his father said, but he thinks he's lying. <laughs> so that's the kind of depth and humor that you can expect on the entire album. My father says my name means I believe, but I think he's lying. That kind of bizarre familial connection and playing with truth and depth and play with language is throughout the entire album. It's called Limbo, and that's very fitting. I'm actually recording this at sunset. I was gonna record it tomorrow morning, but I want it to be at sunset, because sunset is in between day and night. And this is an album that is in between youth and old age. It's an album which is obsessed with maturity and what does it mean to no longer be young. Apparently, he's 26 years old now, and this is the point where he feels that he is getting old. And based on this album, growing old is difficult, human relationships are difficult, and you have to learn to accept responsibility. That's not the theme of a lot of rap albums, certainly not a lot of rap albums by people at age 25, but he's a very, very interesting rapper. And the thing I would have to say about this, why is Amine not a superstar? I know that's a dumb question because probably most people haven't heard of him, but he does a mixture of rap and R&B, which is completely seamless. Usually, if a rap artist also does R&B, my finger's on the, the, the button with the two arrows on it, and I'm like, skip, because very rarely can a rap artist do that well. Or usually, they'll hire people to come in and sing all the hooks. He sings the hooks. He has a beautiful falsetto voice and a very good flow when he raps. He can do both of these things, and he has this way of writing. I mean, you heard me describe Limbo, right? You heard me describe the themes of this album. Very interesting thematics. He's very human. He tells stories about his family. He tells stories about his roots. He tells stories about his life and the way that he's thinking in a way that you really connect to him. I'm, this is going to sound really pretentious, but he's sort of a thinking man's Drake. And by that, I mean, you know, Drake mixes R&B and hip-hop, but like... He isn't that good of a rhyme writer, and he can't really sing. You know, he can sort of sing, and like he sort of talks about relationships, but for the most part, he talks about how much he fails at relationships, you know? Amine is somebody who's really lived life. He's very young, but he's really lived life, and he shares that life with you on his album. And he's able to do it in this way. So I don't know. There's a chance this guy will just be another guy who shows up and, and disappears. But I think there's a real chance that, that he might actually come to become some kind of superstar, because I think he really deserves it. And I think part of it, too, could be that his experience is very unique, right? Um, you know, his experience growing up as an immigrant from Ethiopia in Portland, Oregon, is very different than the African-American experience or, or even the, the white experience growing up poor, right? Like, this experience, this immigrant experience, is a totally different style a totally different lifestyle, different set of challenges, different perspectives, and I think that that's seen in his rap music, which makes it quite interesting. And for me, as somebody who studies French rap music, makes me feel like this is actually very close to a French rap album. You know, somebody who needs to prove his existence and find his place in a racially segregated society uh, and never quite feeling like he belongs. But there isn't too much of that, but there's some. So let me get into the album. Now that I've given you my, my little five minutes of introduction here, uh, of how this guy, I really think, should be a lot more popular than he is. Uh, I'm gonna play you a little bit of the first track. It's the best produced track on the album. Uh, it's nice kind of chopped up soul samples. And the whole song is in that theme of limbo that I've been talking to you about. The idea is bury me before I'm a burden, but ma make sure I'm dead and make sure you're certain, right? It's all about like growing up and 
wanting to like die before you're 30 because you feel too old. And that's also about like race and difficulty and about racism and about the way that he's growing up, a theme that pops up throughout the album several times. So I'm just gonna play you some of this now. You get a sense of his voice, uh, of the way that he raps and the, the atmosphere that's set through most of this album. In general, there's very little trap music. There's very little super techno. It's mostly just nice kind of soulful samples and excellent rhyming and excellent singing. Here we go. When your skin darker, shit gets harder. This a black album, like Sean Carter. Screaming like I'm Rico, marching like I'm Steve-O. So just hearing that there, right? Like you hear just a very kind of standard rap deliverance. Um, lots of interesting things in here. He raps about last time I went to the church was in the effing 80s. Can you believe that? I was born in 1994. <laughs> a lot of themes of truth and lies in this album. Again, with the fact that his name means I believe, but he thinks that's a lie that his father told him. There's another funny thing when he was describing his name. He was like, people always want to call me anime, but I'm like, I don't F with cartoons. And I think it's funny because when I read his name, Amine, I read it as anime at first. And I expected, because his first album cover is like him on a toilet with like a very bright yellow background. So I saw it and I thought, oh, anime, he's going to be like some kind of like weird alternative rap, like J-pop kind of guy. <laughs> but no, it's, it's Ethiopian. Um, then the next track is called Woodlawn. And this apparently refers to a certain area in Portland where he grew up. Um, this is where he shows off that he can actually do a triplet flow. The production is kind of trappish here. Um, this is the most materialistic. In general, this album is anti-materialistic. And not so much like, if you think cars are cool, then you're stupid. It's more like, I'm too old to think that cars are cool. I'm growing up and I'm starting to see what actually matters in life. Cool, like Drake-ish chorus. But again, this guy can actually sing. So it's very different than listening to Drake. Um, a nice kind of flute sample as well uh, on here. The next track is called Kobe. And this is great because it's him talking about what happened when Kobe Bryant died. Now, I'm from Boston, so I don't have any fond feelings for Kobe Bryant. Uh, but certainly his death was a very important moment. And for Amine, he's explaining it like this was the point where he grew up. My only note here is very poetic. I'll show you. I don't have a script. I just have notes. I just wrote, mortality comes to the young man. But that's really what it is. And that happens a lot, right? Like when you're young, you don't expect people to die. But sometimes when people die, that's when you realize that you're mortal. And that happens in your early 20s. Oddly enough, do you know who did that for me? The, the celebrity who died that made me realize that I was going to die. It wasn't Kurt Cobain, it wasn't Jerry Garcia, it was Buffy from the Fat Boys. <laughs> I don't know why it was, but when one of the Fat Boys died, I felt like part of my childhood died. But still, this concept uh, that, that he now understands that he needs to be older, and he talks about, I need to figure out how to buy a house. Like, I need to basically put away the childish things. But the childish things here are, you know, womanizing and buying cars and jewelry, and he's really moving away from that. But I wanna say, before I get too far, this is not a preachy album, talking about how stupid people are for caring about those things. That's something which I think he's doing really well, and that's a hard needle to thread. When you're a rap artist and you're not talking about materialism, to do that in a non-preachy way. I'm telling you, this guy should be a lot more famous than he is. He just should. And you see him in his interviews, and he's just very charismatic, and he's very self-aware, and, and he speaks in a way that's kind of reassuring. You know, he doesn't have any of the kind of like verbal tics that can, that can you know, make you think that, I don't know, it's odd. It's, it's, really, it's really odd this guy's not more famous. But anyway, I'm gonna stop saying that, that's boring. The next track is called Roots, and that's actually about his roots. He raps about Eritrea and about uh, Ethiopia, a cool kind of sloppy soul sample. And then we have two songs in a row which are about relationships real relationship difficulty. First track called Can't Decide. And it's all about who do I blame for a relationship not working. And this is basically just an R&B song, just singing, but I'm not repulsed by it. Normally I am, but it's really cool because it's about a relationship that's not working, but it's very human. It's not blaming, it's not saying, oh, you're a devil woman. It's like, I can't decide. How did this relationship go wrong? I'm gonna go back to Drake. 
Drake sings about relationships, but it's always the same. The, the, the punchline is always the same. I only love my mom and my bed and I'm sorry. That's always the conclusion. Drake's conclusion is always, I just don't care about you. This is a very great human way that is then followed up with the next track, Compensating, which is another relationship pop song. Very catchy, but it's about messing up in a relationship. And here I watched the genius interview with him where he describes the describes writing the song. And he just had this, this idea of like emotionally compensating and how does that play into a relationship. Uh, and he can really sing. Like he is singing everything on here and he has the ability to do that. Next track, Shimmy, maybe the best beat on here. Uh, it's a very conscious reference to Old Dirty Bastard. So if you don't know, Old Dirty Bastard was a member of the Wu-Tang Clan and he was famous for having a very idiosyncratic style, trying to sing and not being able to do it. He was famous for being on food stamps while making a million dollars a year as a member of the Wu-Tang Clan. He was wild, he was raw, he was just completely energetic and he sadly was shot to death for no reason. It's terrible. Um, but well, I remember when I saw the first album cover of him sitting on the toilet, I actually remember thinking, oh cool, is this some guy who's gonna take the old dirty bastard, you know, uh, torch? Is this gonna be the next ODB? Because there hasn't been a next ODB. Because ODB was like the Keith Moon, the John Bonham, the just most gonzo, bizarre, crazy, like so drunk and high all the time that he just would write one verse and repeat it on every song, but yet he would do it in such a way that was just so unbelievably charismatic and successful. So this whole song, Shimmy, is a complete reference to ODB, but he's doing it in a mature way. He is maturing beyond where Old Dirty Bastard was ever able to mature, even though Old Dirty Bastard's second album is surprisingly deep, but I'll get into that some other day. But in this whole song, he's talking about, you know, that's not your necklace, that's the IRS's. And he's talking about money and about the fact that rappers who pretend that they have things don't actually have them. Um, and he actually like has Old Dirty Bastard sampled in the background and he quotes Old Dirty Bastard, like shimmy shimmy ya, different lines that he's famous for saying. Um, and even, I discovered this online, the, the, so the cover of Old Dirty Bastard's first album is his food, can, his food stamp, uh, uh, identification card. And so I mean they did that for him, but it's his library card in Portland. And I think that's a pretty good metaphor for the difference between them. You know, that, that I mean they, uh is rapping in a way that's very original and idiosyncratic, but instead of being totally out there and irresponsible, he's like, reads books. He's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing, right? He's not some super crazy guy out there whose flame is going to burn out. And a lot of this album is about coming to realize that. It sucks when you're in your 20s and you realize you're going to live until you're 80. <laughs> like, oh, Jesus. I'm going to be old. I'm gonna, my back's going to hurt. I don't have to worry about getting sunburned, which I think I did today. I went to a lake. It was complete. That, oh, my, that's a sunburn. Oh, my God. The doctor, Mrs. Payne, will not be happy about that. That's a sunburn. I went to this lake that's completely green because of cyanobacteria. Very interesting. You realize that you're going to get old and you have to, to compensate. You have to understand that. And this track, Shimmy, is a great example of the contradiction of being a rap artist while also trying to be more responsible with your life. Next track, Pressure in My Palms, is, is Amine showing what he can do. And in a way, he's doing what Old Dirty Bastard did. He's just rapping just out of nowhere. The, the first line of the, of, the, of the whole song is, this is Britney Spears when she was bald. Just like, whoa, that's a crazy first line. Uh, it's really cool, um, like the beat's very chopped up and repeated and triggered over and over again in the computer. Uh, cool kind of chorus that's sung, I think, with the help of Vince Staples. A very odd soundscape. This has kind of a very futuristic feel. I'm just gonna read you some of his lyrics here, just for how, how bizarre, but how good they are. This is Britney Spears when she was bald, N-word. Punkin' N-words before there was punked, N-word. Smokin' Ashton Kush so I calm down, N-word. We don't wanna hear your mix mixtape, my N-word. I fade N-words like barbers. I got more pressure in my palms than Arthur. Man, this is like when Fergie Peter pants. That's when Honey used to dance. Matt Burns versus Derek Fisher caught you in a... I hate it when people don't finish their effing sentences. 
So he doesn't finish a sentence and then says, I hate it when you don't finish your sentences. If Steve Harvey say my name wrong, I'll catch a sentence in. So indicating that if you don't, if, if Steve Harvey made the mistake that he made with the Miss World contest, then he would, you know, catch a sentence. He would go to jail for killing him, right? Malice at the palace or Winona up in Saks Fifth. This is meta world peace before the peace came. B word. So funny, like like talking about meta world peace, Ron Artest, the controversial and, and bizarre basketball player who changed his name to meta world peace, who was a part of a brawl in a basketball game and comparing that to Winona Ryder being a, being a shoplifter, a fascinating mixture. And then the whole, al the whole song ends with, a, there's a lot of great little speeches here. The album begins with saying, this is the kind of music you pick someone up from jail with. And then in between here he says, there's no money having hate in your heart. So here's a question for you. Is that an altruistic sentence? Okay, Professor Payne is just out to play right now, okay? So, you know, altruism, being good for good's sake, right? Being good because it's the right thing to do. I don't know if that's the exact definition of altruism. That's how I'm defining it now. If, if you're saying that there's no money having hate in your heart, you're saying it's good not to have hate in your heart, but you're sort of giving the reason for not having hate in your heart that it isn't profitable. So like, if it were profitable to have hate in your heart, to be a jerk, would you then be a jerk? I don't know. That thus ends my philosophy question. Is that an altruistic statement? Put it in the comments, what do you think? There's no money having hate in your heart. Uh, the next track, Riri, is the most Drake-like song. Like, he actually raps a little bit like Drake. The chorus is a little bit, but again, a better singer. Um, this is a song which shows his ability to reference diverse things. He references Kelly and Regis, Andre 3000, who's very clearly an influence, and Yoko Ono. References all those things in this song. The next track, Easy, is one of the most uplifting rap songs I can think of. Rap, when it's uplifting, is often cheesy, right? Like... I don't listen to this music to feel good. <laughs> At least that's not usually the reason why people listen, right? Often people listen to rap to confront hard truths, right? Or they listen to rap to engage with a certain emotion or aggression or feeling, right? But like uplifting is rarely a successful mode in rap music. This is a great, exa a great, great example of that, but it's complicated. Because the whole song is about the maturity of love and that love isn't easy. So this guy, who can rap, can sing a song, a duet with a woman, Summer Walker, and have this song, the same time he was doing the whole Old Dirty Bastard thing, I was totally on board. And then here he's singing a song about love not being easy and I'm totally on board. Very, very difficult to do both those things at the same time. And it's cool because he makes reference to his mom telling him this shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise that love isn't easy. And then it ends with this message. Tell your man you trust him. Tell your girl you love her. Tell your dad you miss him. And call your mom and thank her. Tell your daughter you love her. And tell your son you're proud of him. Tell yourself you got this, because these times get hard, but nothing is easy. It's good. It's a good song. You know what? Don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Listen to Easy. Okay, I want you to listen to that, that first track, uh, Burden, and I want you to listen to Shimmy, but also listen to Easy. And you'll, you'll be on board. You'll be like, Sky, I don't know how you're right, but somehow those cheesy, cheesy-ass lyrics you just said work in the song. And again, much like there was a, a, a little like two or three song sequence of mature love, here there's this reference to his mom and what his mom says, and there's a little thing here about parental influence on life. It, between him talking about his dad saying that's his name and these parents reference, there's a lot about intergenerational relationships, which could potentially be, hmm, I, I wonder if there's like some kind of theme there, because you definitely, okay. I'm starting to think maybe there might be an interesting emphasis on intergenerational relationships uh, uh, in the immigrant experience more than uh, the experience of someone who's making music in the culture where they're from. But I'm not ready to develop that theory yet. 
But I think there might be a theory there based on the importance of a family unit and the sense of isolation and the additional bonding that is created. Anyways, let's get back to the song Mama, which is the next track here. Uh, this is a great story. It's just an ode to his mom. It's not like many of them. Usually a song that it, it, most rap songs about about your mom are like, I messed up, I did all these bad things, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This really is more of an elegy, like a, not an elegy, but a celebration of her. Like talking about how she worked at the post office for 20 years. Um, a little bit too much of the, I wanna buy you a car, I wanna buy you a this. My favorite line in the whole album uh, is where he talks about that, that, that trope in rap songs about your mom. And he does talk about Tupac in here. You can't have a song about your mom and not mention Tupac's name. Although maybe you could. You know, there's that movie Palm Springs that came out that was like Groundhog Day, but better and with two people in it. And they never talked about Groundhog Day, even though it was the same theme. It'd be like if you made a movie about catching ghosts and never said Ghostbusters. This is a song about mamas, but I don't think he needed to quote Tupac. But anyways, there's a beautiful line in here where he's talking about his mom and how she was disappointed in him when he was misbehaving. And he says, bad little N-word, of course I was a balege. Balege? Turns out, based on my research, the word balege is uh, Amharic. That's the Ethiopian dialect that he speaks. Um, Herik, or that his parents speak, which is a, a word for naughty or misbehaving. And this is where I am so happy <laughs> that I've studied French music and French hip hop because this is absolutely essential. 100% essential. The usage, the stray usage of the first language or the mother tongue by rappers or musicians is an absolutely essential marker of identity. It's just using this one word means that every single Eritrean and Ethiopian immigrant to America who hears this song will go, someone is singing for me. Someone knows what this is like to live their entire life in English. But then, balege, <sighs> that comfort, that connection to home through language is something that rap can do particularly well which is why when you study French hip hop, it's crazy, because <laughs> so much of it is written in West African languages or North African languages and French and English mixed in from hip hop. It's just a, it's a, it's a smorgasbord of, of language. And I, I don't know Amine's music very well, but I'd love to see more of this native language coming in because it brings so much more depth to the music. The next track, nice West Coast beat. Kind of laid back synths hitting octaves, you know, woo, woo. but the thematics of this are something I have never considered. Well, I've considered, but I've never heard. It's called Becky. And if you know, Becky is a shorthand word in the rap community, in the African-American community. Okay, well, seeing as everything that is adopted in the African-American community is eventually taken by the rest of America, we will just say, in modern American parlance, the word Becky is shorthand for a white girl. So when I saw the word Becky, I'm like, okay, wh where, where, where are we going here? What's the story gonna be about? And it is, once again, going back to parents. But this is in a bad way. This is about the difficulty of being in an interracial relationship. Him being black and Becky being white. But there's no part of this that is about any kind of the weird racist exoticism that sometimes gets into this, these kinds of thematics. None of this is about overt racism or people throwing rocks at them. This is all about the unspoken things in public and the spoken things that are private at home. It opens up with, Mama said, don't ever bring a white girl home to me. I'm telling you, Amine is great and he's doing things that other rap artists aren't doing and this is why. He just sang a whole song, hey mom, I love you, you're the greatest, and you work so hard. And then the next track is like, but my mom is racist, and she won't let me love who I want to love, and her ideas are backwards and wrong, and I'm going to tell you how, and I'm going to show the way that her racism towards white girls isn't that much different than the white girl's racism towards me. Thank you, Amine, for doing this great human work of art, which shows us that these problems of racism are usually a question of power right? The problem with racism is power, and the people who have the power usually look like me. 
right? And it goes down that direction. But racism is not limited to people who look like me. It's the power imbalance that's limited to people that look like me. This is the way that racism affects and hurts people in their daily life, in their emotional life, in their spiritual life, no matter what their color is. And this whole song is about that, about how he's fed up. He's fed up with the fan, that's what he says. Fed up with work, I mean, fed up with the world I know I can't change. He talks, he talks about he's fed up with going to the malls and seeing the people look at him in the restaurants and the way that it must be for him to live this life saying it's just not worth it. The words that he uses are, it's not a law, but you know we ain't the same. This is beautiful. And this echoes many conversations I've had with many people, especially people who've grown up in smaller communities, right? Like there's no way you're not gonna marry somebody of our community. There's no way you're gonna marry outside of our religion or outside of our race or outside of our ethnic group, right? That's a very common thing that happens. The sort of, the concept of, oh, marry who you love and just seek whoever it is often comes from a position of privilege or at least societal privilege. He's just able to do this and he's able to make a whole song about it and again, I don't live this experience, I've never lived this experience, but I imagine this song is a gift to many, many people who have lived this and feel trapped by the racism that surrounds us on all sides at all times when we're just trying to be human beings. Next track is called Fetus. Okay, how about, how about Amine goes even further? So, so what have we done? Okay, we've talked about how great we talked about Kobe, how Kobe's like a dad and he died and that makes him realize he has to grow up. We talked about how his dad says his name means I believe, but he thinks he might be a liar. We talked about how his mom is a wonderful person who's also racist. Now, we're gonna talk about the problems of being a father. The song is called Fetus. It's with Injury Reserve, another great independent rap group who I love. You can watch my video of them up there. Although my dad, who watches these videos, hi, Pa, he tells me that when I do this, nothing pops up. But I don't know if he's telling the truth because he isn't as good with technology as he could be. So something might be up there right now. If there is, just so you know, Pa. So I'm, I'm gonna wait to do it now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, and then there should be like a little thing there with text, and that's when you click on it, okay? Okay, so this is with Injury Reserve. So we've gone through the drama of parents, and now it's the question of what does he do with a fetus? And it's talking about knocking up his girlfriend, and should he have the baby? It's just a discussion. It's like, I want to and I don't want to. And he has another very real human conversation about do I want to bring a baby into this world? I mean, like he sort of says like, should I bring them into this world? Like he talks about the problems with it. They're giving out guns with every Happy Meal, a shooter every month, they pretend it's daffodils. My son will probably see that fire before a fire drill. So we don't really know. Like we don't know where he ends up on this question. It's just like, there's a pregnant woman, and what do we do? What choice do we make? That's the question. He even says in here, to my future daughter or son, the streams from this album are going to pay for your college funds. And then the members of Injury Reserve come on. A very well-produced beat, by the way, like, like nice kind of futuristic, good sound. And, and it's like, they come on and, and they say like, I don't even know if I can afford a college fund based on how little money you make being a good artist. <laughs> so, you know what, Injury Reserve, I'm sorry, I should have bought your album. Like, I should have paid you money, because that's a really good record. And I mean, I should buy this record, actually. So, I'll get to that. Because artists don't make much money anymore. And can they even raise kids if they don't make enough money? These are real questions. These are very real human questions. And then there's a, another amazing line in here. Um, after talking about the importance of birth control, he says, I hope I can be half the father that my mama was. Now, this is not Amine, this is a member from Injury Reserve saying this. I hope I can be half the father my mama was. A beautiful line, contradictory. You know, ex you know what that means. Don't pretend like you don't. You know what that means. I've never heard it before. There's some great things happening on this album. You know, I almost didn't review this. I think I heard that Woodlong song and I sort of thought, eh, it's kind of trappy, eh, a little too sing-songy. I'm really glad I stuck with it. And then it ends with this whole, like, skit, sketch, the song ends, um, in, which, uh, in which they talk about how, like, you can be rich and have all this stuff, but have you ever eaten 
a grapefruit. Like, grapefruits are delightful. Like, a little bit of sugar, that's better than a Ferrari. This is a theme album. It all ties in to this theme of growing up. It's a theme of growing up. Like, how do you grow up? You grow up by understanding your parents' weaknesses, by understanding their strengths. You grow up by considering your own role in human creation. You grow up by seeing your idols die and confronting your mortality. And you grow up by realizing that a grapefruit is better than a Ferrari. Ferraris are fun, Ferraris are cool, but a grapefruit, grapefruits are so good. Now, I used to eat a grapefruit every day at 10 a.m., but then it's terrible for your enamel. I don't know if you can tell it, my teeth game. I do not have the best teeth in the business. That, that will always belong to Anthony Fantano. <clears throat> I don't talk about him much, but uh, he's another music reviewer. He's very successful, and he has very good teeth. Um, so then we come to the next track, uh, My Reality, which is cool because he actually references Grapefruit again in here. He has a great Allen Iverson reference. Allen Iverson, the controversial basketball player who is famous for saying, uh, practice? I'm skipping practice? So this is the quote here. I'm stepping over N-words and I'm skipping the practice. Al, when it comes to the checks, I'm like, taxes? Taxes? And we're coming back to this theme again of how do you get older? What do you do? How do you, you know, the other day I was at a gardening center and there was this woman and she's wearing a shirt that said, I can't adult today. And I just wanted to take her and just say, why would you communicate that to the world? What's wrong with you? Grow up. Don't. Just do it. Just pay your taxes. Just do the work. Raise your kids. Be like Amine. You know, you gotta, you gotta realize Kobe's gonna die. And you gotta pay taxes. Some cool kind of vocoder songs on here, sounds on here. Almost kind of a Marvin Gaye feeling, um, which the album doesn't sound that much like, uh, like, you know, what's going on. But at times I would say that's sort of the soundscape here. Just kind of a laid back feeling you know, with the production. Uh, a nice kind of like finding peace in your dreams, a very sort of anti-materialist theme that goes through most of this album, except for that one song, Woodlawn, because it's all about how a grapefruit is better than a Ferrari. It ends with someone singing, uh, not him, and then there's a, a like a gospel group underneath, adding just having it end with sort of a Kanye-ish gospel flourish. So there you go. I don't know what I'm gonna put on the on the thumbnail for this, Probably why isn't Amine a superstar? Um, or why Amine is better than Drake? You know, if I do the why is he better than Drake, I'll get more clicks. But that's not really the point of the video. It's really he should be a superstar because he's that good. Okay, well, it's sunset here. I'm going to cook some dinner. Uh, well, actually, maybe the Dr. and Mrs. Payne is going to cook dinner. Either way, I'm going to eat. Uh, so for uh, Yoko Ono, there's the camera.